Hello, and welcome to Music Theory Fundamentals Lecture 1. My name is Jocelyn Gorenson, and I am your teacher. This is the first of a series of videos that I've put together to help assist students that I teach in the Music Theory Fundamentals class at Messiah University. However, I hope that these videos will be helpful for other people who have an interest in learning the basics of music theory. Before we get started learning some terminology, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in a musical family. Music was always around the house. My mother is a professional pianist, and my father is a professional trumpet player. I have three brothers, and we all learned music growing up. In fact, it wasn't unusual for friends to stop by, hear a piano lesson coming from the basement, a trumpet lesson in the living room, someone practicing piano in a different room, and someone practicing a different wind instrument in a bedroom. And my friends would walk through the door and say, how do you live like this? And we said, we don't even notice it. This is just normal for us. Growing up in a musical home and a musical family, it's not a huge surprise that I decided to major in music in college. That's also where I met my husband, who is also a professional musician. So we met in college, fell in love, got married, Moved to Texas for 10 years where I did my master's degree and where we got our first teaching jobs, and then moved to Pennsylvania where we started our jobs here at Messiah University in the fall of 2012. In addition to teaching music theory fundamentals, I also teach other things including flute. I did study the piano for 13 years when I was growing up, but my degrees are in flute performance and I would consider that to be my primary instrument. When I'm not busy teaching or performing music, I have plenty of other things in my life that are hobbies or responsibilities to keep me busy. I have two children and I've homeschooled them from the beginning. And yes, they also take music lessons. There are a lot of other things that I enjoy in life. I actually minored in English, mostly because I loved reading and writing so much. I enjoy doing a lot of other fun things with my family, like board games or hiking or kayaking. I enjoy cooking and I'm an amateur hand letterer. That's mostly because when I was growing up, my penmanship was terrible. And I decided a few years ago that it was time to learn how to write something that actually looked nice. I grew up in West Virginia and I did my undergraduate degree at West Virginia University. It might surprise you to know that when I was growing up, I really wasn't much of a sports fan. I have three brothers, but they were the ones who were into watching the sports games while I had more important books to read. So I decided my freshman year of college that it was time for me to understand this thing called football. I knew the basics, first down, second down, touchdown, but there were a lot of little rules in the game about which I was completely clueless. So I had some very patient friends who came with me and I attended every single home football game my freshman year. I say they were patient because throughout every game, they'd make a call on the field and I would whisper to one or the other next to me, what did they just say? What did that mean? What's going on? I don't understand. <laughs> By the end of the football season, I knew a lot more about football than I did at the beginning. Why? Because I had patient friends who were willing and able to explain the rules of the game to me. Also, through this process of learning and understanding the rules better, I grew to appreciate the game more. Football changed from something that I passively tolerated <laughs> to something that I understood and enjoyed much more deeply because I understood the rules of the game better. This is what I hope this semester's class will be like for you. Some of you have a musical background, some of you have little or none. My hope is through the process of learning the basics of music theory fundamentals, you will grow to have a greater appreciation for the sounds that you hear in music and how they work together and 
why they give you the feelings that they give you. So now without further delay or explanation, let's get started. In this introductory lecture for Music Theory Fundamentals, we'll be discussing several key concepts and how they apply to the sounds of music that you hear in everyday life. The first is pitch, and we'll discuss frequency, duration, intensity, and timbre. We'll also get into some concepts of texture, meter, and instrumentation. I like to start every semester with this loaded question. What is this? I get a variety of answers to this question. One of the most common is, it's a note. Another frequent answer is, it's a pitch. And occasionally, someone will answer, that's an A natural. There are subtle differences between a note and a pitch. Let's take a look at what those differences are. This is a note. This is a pitch. A note is something that might show up on the staff, like the one we see here, whereas a pitch can just be a sound with no written indication that specifies anything about that pitch. There are some fundamental concepts we need to understand when it comes to recognizing the characteristics of a pitch. The first is the frequency. Frequency is what we might refer to as the highness or lowness of a pitch. Pitches up here have a very high frequency, whereas pitches down here have a low frequency. Frequency is probably a word you learned when you were growing up and learning some concepts of physics. It can refer to sound waves, and sound waves can come in different shapes and different heights and depths, but they also occur at different frequencies. And the difference in frequency, in other words, how many waves there are per second, is what changes the difference in the highness or lowness of the pitch. Using the Tonal Energy Tuner app, I can share my screen with you and show you how a familiar sound of an orchestra tuning shows up as an A. You'll notice at the top of the screen it says A equals 440.0 hertz. That number represents the frequency of waves per second. 440 creates the pitch A. When I change to the spectral function on this app, you can see 100, 400, 1600, etc. I'm going to play for you an A, and it will show up slightly to the right of the 400 because this is A440. Now that we've learned the meaning of frequency in terms of pitch and its highness or lowness, we're going to talk about duration. Duration is simply the length. Pitches can be heard at different lengths. We can hear a long duration, or a short duration. So our third concept is volume or intensity. This refers to the loudness or softness of a pitch. I'll demonstrate with two different pitches that will be 
the same frequency, the same highness or lowness, the same duration, so they'll last roughly the same amount of time, but they will have different volumes or intensities. Here's the first one. And here is the second one. Our final concept is timbre. Timbre refers to the color of the sound. Now I know that might seem like a confusing concept. We think of colors as being visual and sound as being something we listen to. However, Pitches can be the same frequency, the same duration, and roughly the same volume or intensity, but have completely different timbres. Let's examine what I mean by this. What you just heard should have been a very familiar tune, but probably not a familiar setting. We heard Twinkle Twinkle Little Star represented by different timbres, different colors, and we could hear those different colors when we listened to different instruments. Let's listen again, but this time I'll give you a bit of a visual aid. Now that we've spent some time discussing elements of pitch, which include frequency, duration, intensity, and timbre, let's talk about how pitches can interact with each other to create musical sounds. One of those ways is in texture. And texture has to do with sounds in music and how they interact with each other. Examples you just heard in the Twinkle Twinkle demonstrations are representative of monophonic texture. A monophonic texture consists of a single musical line without accompaniment. We heard single instrument demonstrations in the Twinkle Twinkle examples. A monophonic can also be many voices singing the same melody together. We hope to hear this when the family stands around the birthday cake, but sometimes we're not so lucky. The second type of texture we're going to learn is called homophonic. Homophonic can sound different depending on how it's being represented. Here we see that it's characterized by the movement of accompanying parts in the same rhythm as the melody. For example, if our melody is... This melody can be supported by homorhythmic and homophonic sounds. In other words, all the voices are moving at the same time. Sometimes homophonic texture can be represented in what we would call melody and accompaniment. Let's see an example of this.
In terms of texture, so far we've covered monophonic, meaning mono, one, phonic, sound. We've learned about homophonic, meaning the same and sound. This means there's one melody and everything else supports the melody either in the same rhythm or sometimes in an accompanimental figure. The third type of texture we're going to learn is polyphonic. Poly meaning more than one or many and phonic meaning sound. Here it's defined as two or more parts, each having a melody of its own. We're going to hear an example of this at the piano. First, we'll hear the voices separately. They each could hold their own as a strong melody, but then when you put them together, they make a polyphonic texture. More than one melody happening simultaneously. Now that we've learned how pitches can be organized into different musical textures, let's learn about how they can be organized into different meters. In organized musical sound, we can think of meter as a repeated succession of strong and weak beats. Today we're going to talk about three different types of meter. The first is duple, the second is triple, and the third is quadruple. When we talk about duple, meaning two in our meter, we have an organization of strong and weak beats alternating. So if a conductor is conducting this, we have our beat one, which is our strong beat and sometimes called our down beat because that's when the conductor's hands go down. And we have beat two, which in comparison is a weak beat. If you listen to me as I conduct, one, two, one, two, one, two, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak. Let's hear an example of this played by myself and my husband. I'll be on the flute and he'll be playing his bassoon. <laughs> Did you hear the alternating strong and weak beats? One, two, one, two. The genre of music you just heard is called a march, and this was from the Stars and Stripes Forever by John Philip Sousa. We hear this frequently on the 4th of July. Marches are pretty much always written in duple meter. Can you guess why? If you said it's because we have two feet, you've got the right answer. Next, let's hear an organization of beats that is triple meter. In other words, we still have our strong beat on the downbeat, one, but now we'll have a weak beat on beat two and beat three. One, two, three. One, two, 
three. Strong, weak, weak. Strong, weak, weak. Strong, weak, weak. <laughs> What you just heard was a minuet. A minuet was a type of dance, always written in triple meter. In fact, at the time that minuets were written, if you knew the steps, you could dance the minuet, even if you had never heard that particular minuet before. Think of it this way, and I'll be dating myself a little bit here, but imagine that thousands of pieces had been written called the electric slide. Yes, I warned you, I'm dating myself. At any rate, imagine that thousands of pieces had been written called the electric slide and you decided to show up to a dance and the musicians in the corner decided that they were going to play an electric slide. Well, you might never have heard this particular piece of music before, but if you knew the steps, you could do the dance. This is how menuets worked back in the day. You learn the same steps and anytime you heard a menuet, you could go through those same steps with your dance partner, regardless of whether you'd heard that particular piece of music before. While there are many different combinations of strong and weak beats that can make up meter, today we're going to limit ourselves to duple, triple, which we've already discussed, and now quadruple, which is an organization of strong, weak, weak, weak. One, two, three, four. Again, we have a downbeat at the beginning, one, then the hand goes inward toward the body, or this way if you're using the other hand, for beat two, outward toward the wall for beat three, and then upward for beat four. So if we hear them all together, it's one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. With beat one still being the strongest of the four beats. Let's hear an example. <laughs> Different instruments that we recognize today can be organized into different instrument families. We have strings, we have brass, we have woodwinds, we have percussion, and more recently we have the vast number of sounds that can be created using electronic means and electronic manipulation. I'm actually going to provide for you a link in the description below to a Disney short film from the 1950s. Now, there are some great things about this film, namely that it talks about how different instrument families came into being and what makes some instruments different from others and how they function and how they are played and in how they evolved. However, being from the 1950s, I will warn you right off the bat that there are some very cringe-worthy moments in this video. We would never represent things in terms of gender roles or racial relations the same way today that they did in the 50s. So let's talk about that as a class also. There are some shocking things in the video. It is amazing that we can look at some of the things that were represented here and think that's how they treated music education for children in the 50s. And sadly, the answer is yes. So we take the good with the bad. We discuss it, we hash it out, and we learn and we grow from it. For the next class, bring an example of music that you like to listen to. You need to discuss it in terms of genre. In other words, what category does it fit into? Instrumentation. What instruments do you hear? Texture. How do the different musical voices interact with each other? And meter. 
what organization of strong and weak beats do you hear? Is it duple meter, triple meter, quadruple meter, something else entirely? So be prepared to share your example and talk about it in the next class. Thanks so much for watching. I look forward to working with you this semester.